Good evening, and welcome to those of you who are gathered here in person in the Alvarez College Union in the Seashaw Smith 900 room, and those who are joining us from around the globe as far as Nairobi and Guatemala City on the live stream tonight. Welcome to our 10th annual Nisbet Venture Fund Pitch Competition. I'm Liz Brigham, W. Spencer Mitchum Director of Innovation and Entrepreneurship at the Hurt Hub at Davidson. At the Hurt Hub, we provide access and exposure to innovation and entrepreneurship for all. We believe that innovation is born out of our values of freedom, integrity, and inclusion. And tonight's competition is a shining example of our values and vision at work. The Nisbet Venture Fund was established in 2014 through generous support from Marion Nisbet and Chip Nisbet, Davidson class of 1986. The Nisbet Venture Fund is a great example of the power of philanthropy in supporting innovation and entrepreneurship here at Davidson. Without their support and the support of all of our donors and members and community friends, thank you for those of you who are gathered here tonight, we would not be able to provide our Davidson students, faculty, staff, alumni, co-working members, and entrepreneurs in our community with the support they need to be successful in building and growing their businesses. I'd like to start tonight by recognizing and applauding all of our student and young alumni finalists gathered here. and on Zoom as well. And in addition to the countless hours of independent and extracurricular work these students and alums have put into their ventures, the 12 finalist teams pitching tonight also completed six weeks of educational classes, mentoring, and pitch practice to get them prepared to present to you this evening. Some of our finalists have been in our program since their first year at Davidson, which was also my first year at the Hurt Hub, so I'm getting a little emotional about my first graduating class. But some of you all here tonight have joined us for the first time. All of these students, again, are doing this work extracurricularly. No one is getting credit for what they are doing. They have conviction, and they love their ventures and what they're focused on to drive impact in their communities. I'd also like to take a moment to thank our mentors. So if you're a mentor, you want to raise your hand if you're in the audience and be recognized. Thank you. We had 20 mentors who supported our finalists from a range of industries and backgrounds. Our mentors are Davidson alumni, Hurt Hub co-working members, members of Launch CLT, and our broader community. Also, a major thank you to Rebecca Weeks Watson, who I saw came in. Oh, she's right there. Thank you, Rebecca. <laughs> Rebecca has been a stalwart, huge part of all of our educational programming, but in this context was the cohort instructor over the last six weeks, not only meeting with these students during those classes, but also during one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. Thank you to our Hurt Hub leadership team, student interns, Davidson College staff, and Rigid AV, all distributed around the room. You know it takes a village to pull something like this off, so thank you all. And it is my distinct pleasure to introduce and thank our two judging panels, which is actually a new feature this year. Our first panel will judge the incubation track, and it includes Will Brawley, Davidson class of 1996, Will co-owns Schedule Fly and hosts the Restaurant Owners Uncorked podcast, a top 10 worldwide hospitality podcast. Sherrod Davis, Davidson class of 2013. Sherrod serves as Ecomap's co-founder and CEO and has been instrumental in developing Baltimore's tech ecosystem. Christine Nicodemus is a serial ed tech entrepreneur, most recently launching Wayhaven after successfully scaling and exiting Aperture Education. And our second panel of judges, seated right behind them, will score the acceleration track. First, Jay Bennett Waters, Davidson class of 1994. Bennett is the president and CEO of NC Innovation. 
In addition to his current and past leadership experiences in business, he's also served in two presidential administrations. Whitney A. White, Davidson class of 2008. Whitney is the CEO and co-founder of Equity Commons, and in 2015, Whitney founded the Davidson Tech Impact Fund, which has benefited many of our students and community members at the Hurt Hub. And Jay Hurt, Davidson class of 1998. Jay is the former president and CEO of the Hurt Company, and without Jay's tremendous generosity, the Jay Hurt Hub for Innovation and Entrepreneurship would not exist. So thank you so much, Jay. And finally... <laughs> A big thank you to the Nisbet family seated with us here. Marion Nisbet and her son Chip have been stalwart supporters of students interested in entrepreneurship at Davidson, among so many other initiatives on this campus for many, many years. They have truly committed to supporting Davidson's statement of purpose in helping students develop humane instincts and creative and disciplined minds to lead lives of leadership and service. Thank you for endowing this program, Marion and Chip. You have changed the trajectory of not just the students and young alums who are gathered here tonight, but of countless students and alums for the last decade and decades to come. Thank you. I will now turn it over to our uh, alumni innovator in residence, Donna Peters, class of 1989. She will be our MC for the evening. Thank you. Uh, good evening, everybody. I have a lot of things on my resume because I've lived a little while, and the thing that makes me smile the most on my resume right now is having had a chance to serve for the last almost two years as the innovator in residence at the Hurt Hub. So I uh, thank you, Liz, and the team for allowing me to be a part of it. When I was thinking about tonight, for some reason, an image of a crystal ball came into my head. And I thought, usually when we talk about a crystal ball, it's almost always negative or from a position of wanting. We always say, I wish I had a crystal ball or I don't have a crystal ball. But tonight is different. You do have a crystal ball tonight because you are seeing the future in every face and every story that you're going to see tonight. You are peeking into the future. And I promise you, it's going to be a future that you want to live in. So we are so excited to give you a chance to experience this. So we're going to do this in two different ways. There are two tracks of presentations tonight. One is called the incubation track, and the other is the acceleration track. The incubation track will have five teams presenting for three minutes to our judges, and they will receive written feedback from the judges competing for a $5,000 cash prize. And our second track is the acceleration track, and they will be seven teams, I say teams, sometimes they're solo, seven presenters, seven opportunities, seven ventures, presenting for seven minutes with three minute Q&A, and they're competing for a $25,000 equity investment. So five teams with three minutes, seven teams with seven minutes and three minutes Q&A for $5,000 and $25,000. And as we know from the Merry Wives of Windsor, good luck lies in odd numbers. All right, so a couple of logistics. In between the incubation track and the acceleration track, the judges will be moving and transitioning. There'll be different judging panels for the two tracks. And during that time, we are going to invite Chip Nisbet, I think I saw you in the halo, Chip Nisbet up onto the stage to share a few words on behalf of the Nisbet family, because remember, we are here at the Nisbet Venture Fund competition. And so it's a real honor to have you here tonight, and we'll have him up on stage in a moment. And then when it's time for the judging, we will have a reception downstairs for about 20 minutes, it'll be a chance for you to mill about and meet each other and maybe get introduced and introduce yourself to the competitors here tonight. And then for those of you that are online, we'll give you a notice and then hopefully you can come back in 20 minutes. During that 20 minutes, the judges will be deliberating and then we'll come back and we will award prizes. All right, so are you all at the right event? <laughs> We're in the right room? 
Yeah? All righty. So, uh, we're going to get started. So, our first presenter tonight will be Kate Phipps, class of 2026, with her venture, Airfit. Right, ready? Good. All right. Awesome. This past summer, I went to Italy with my family, and although Italy was lovely, the trip back was strenuous. The long lines, the crowded spaces, nothing to do but wait. We spent our over five-hour labor wandering from convenience store to convenience store, smelling every perfume and cologne in sight. By the end of it, we were frustrated and bored and honestly a little bit dizzy. I knew that my time would have been much better spent elsewhere, perhaps even in a gym. And that made me wonder, why aren't there gyms in airports? So I did some research and I found that gyms are much more common in airports outside of the US than within and are often found connected to hotels outside of security. So this is an untapped market. In the Charlotte airport alone, over 100,000 people pass through each day with layovers as long as five hours coming from all over the world. The addition of a fitness outlet to any airport would alleviate so many travel related stressors from time to health to culture. With time specifically, airlines are beginning to set minimum labor requirements to account for potential complications during flights. With regards to health, there are a variety of ways to spend excess money and calories that you otherwise would not spend. And then there's culture. There's a distinct health and fitness culture globally, thanks to smartwatches and Fitbits and a general sense of nutritional awareness, and there is nothing tailored to suit the needs of this group of people in an airport. In order to solve these issues and more, I, Kate Phipps, give you AirFit. Picture a clean, cool oasis, one that directly contrasts the crowded stress immediately outside the doors. Serenity in a place where there is none. This place has free weights and treadmills and pre-cores, and even showers to refresh afterwards, and locker rooms for carry-ons and other personal items. AirFit also offers classes to suit a variety of different fitness needs. The addition of AirFit to the Charlotte airport and eventually others internationally would create a healthier and happier population. From the airline employees to the business travelers to the frequent flyers and even the average traveler who might pass through once or twice a year, AirFit's target audience comes from all over. Down the line, AirFit aims to partner with large platforms like Delta, American Airlines, Planet Fitness, American Express, and even Star Alliance, to name a few. These platforms would benefit by having another perk to offer their members, and AirFit would benefit from additional marketing. Through these pre-existing memberships, Clients can easily purchase day passes, but we will also be accepting walk-ins at an increased rate. If I win the Nisbet, my next steps will involve doing as much market research as possible, starting with business meetings with officials in the Charlotte airport to establish a solid business plan around this venture. By the end of the summer, I plan to have a formal blueprint of the AirFit facility drafted and to have begun my search for additional partners. I know that everyone in this room is probably thinking about how much they think they would benefit from having access to a fitness lounge like AirFit on their next travel day. So please join me and help to make it a reality and thank you for your time. All right, our next competitor is Groton. Let's bring to the stage Alp Nixarli. He will be presenting also on behalf of his partner, Chan Oflazolu. Hello, am I good to start? Oops. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for organizing such a beautiful event. I'm Alp, and today with my co-founder, Chan from Amsterdam, we introduce you to Groton. The Netherlands is facing a big housing shortage right now. With over 400,000 houses lacking, uh, the rent prices have increased by nearly 50% in the last two years. And there are two sides to this problem. First, tenants struggle to find housing due to increasing prices and scams. In the Dutch universities and companies don't offer housing, leaving individuals to find um, houses in a difficult way. In fact, my roommate, in fact, my uh, co-founder Chan might not be able to continue studies in Amsterdam if he doesn't find a roommate to share, share his rent with. 
Secondly, uh, landlords struggle with um, rental management and uh, permit issues uh, because of the uh, uh, the housing crisis in the Netherlands. And this has led to more than 11,000 uh, formal complaints about um, landlords in the last year alone. The main way they do it right now is that they either um, go to real estate agents or they self-list. And this causes two problems. It either has high commission rates or high prices. Groton will eliminate those fees and uh, provide a lower commission with targeted AI-based info services. On the other side, Tenants uh, risk getting scammed or paying high mediation fees, wasting time in um, finding the right house. Groton will eliminate the, the, those fees and provide a, se a secure platform where one can find the right house and the right roommate. Based on our research, including more than 500 properties, having a housemate decreased the cost significantly. And just to get an idea of the demand, we've created a WhatsApp group of over 250 active users and built a website that provides more information. To assess user product compatibility, we've developed a prototype Discord bot that, um, and gathered feedback from our early users regarding our platform's functionalities. In two months, Groton will launch and target self-listing uh, landlords in Amsterdam and who will pay 1.5% commission. And we will focus on international students seeking secure housing. In two years, Groton will have an online marketplace for household, household items and a freelance job platform for uh, house services like cooking or cleaning. Within five years, Groton aims to capture 5% market share in Amsterdam's private rental market, with a base of 20,000 landlords. Right now, we're discussing uh, with lawyers about our uh, algorithm's legal boundaries, and we're working on the back end of our product. We're the right team for this, as I'm a back end developer with years of AI experience studying computer science in Davidson, and my co founder, Chan, has extensive experience with project management, and he's studying economics at the University of Amsterdam with honors. If we get the 5,000 price, we'll spend 2,000 in the initial incorporation process, and re the remaining 3,000 will be invested in uh, acquiring advanced skills to expedite our development tasks. And thank you very much for listening to us. Let's now welcome Peter Martinez and Kashan Vias, both class of 2024, for Sensory Symbio. How's it going, guys? How's it going, guys? My name is Peter Martinez. My name is Kishan, and today we're pitching Sensory Symbio. Just to begin, can I get a quick raise of hands if you have social media? That's mostly everybody here, but there's a lack in this space. So growing up, I had a friend called Andy, childhood best friend, and he lost his vision due to a sports injury in middle school. And throughout that time, we stayed closely connected. But one of the things that he highlights as a problem to him is he kind of feels isolated. There's not many social outlets out there. So we're trying to address that problem by creating Sensory Symbio, which is a social platform designed to be accessible for the blind community. Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, don't do not really cater to this audience. And there's a lot of accessible features on iPhones and Android phones. So we're using to use those features to kind of create this app. And Peter will go more into it. So our solution, like, like Keyshawn said, is creating a social media platform that's brand new and really focused on the user-centric design. We want to make this as accessible as possible to people within the blind community and really make them feel comfortable and tailored to their specific needs. So we're going to be using a lot of AI-driven features to kind of promote the mission that we have at hand, right? The first thing is voice messaging. Been around for a long time, but that's going to be a staple of our app. The second thing which we're really excited about is AI image recognition. Most people use Snapchat. What we're trying to do is you're able to snap a picture 
AI will be able to decipher what's going on in that picture and kind of explain it to audiences who cannot see. The third is meaningful connection matching. We're hoping to, you know, hopefully have a good amount of users and connect users who have similar interests so they kind of have, you know, somebody to talk to, somebody to engage with. And the fourth thing is inclusive design feedback. Something, you know, we and Peter, you know, thank God we have our vision, but a lot of people, we can't understand what a blind person is going through, so we're going to constantly use human feedback and AI data-driven feedback to continuously innovate the app and make it more and more accessible as time goes on. So moving forward a little bit with our next steps of what we would plan to do with a $5,000 investment. So we'd take about half of that and invest in a front-end development team and really work on bringing our app to market and getting to those features and making them at the high quality user level experience that we're looking to do and provide. About $2,000 we're planning to spend on working with people within the blind community, market outreach, uh, small group sessions, just learning what people really would benefit from and be able to use for our app and just to make it as tailored as possible. On the road to profit, we're looking to charge about 99 cents per month in a subscription based uh, software setting and we're planning on donating 10% of our profits. We've already been talking to the Foundation Finding Blindness and trying to work with them and, and get that rolling. Uh, looking forward with the timeline, we're hoping by January of next year, rolling out the, the, fir the finished app development and then the beta launch a few months later in March. And then by the end of the year, we're hoping to be uh, up and running and have over 1,000 users. So we really thank you guys and uh, want to make us uh, be able to get to the future and make the most accessible social media app. Thank you. All right, next up, we have Surfo. Let's introduce Benjamin Moorhead and Tyler Yaunt, both class of 2024. Hey everyone, my name is Ben Moorhead and this is Tyler Yaunt and this is our app-based company, Surfo. All right, so I'm gonna run through a couple of scenarios for you guys. Ben's studying abroad in Australia, he's going to New Zealand, he wants to surf, but he's alone. Our friend Joe, he's a social media influencer, he just booked a solo trip to Paris. I'm playing in my last several cross game in Charleston, and I'm from Seattle. I have no friends or family in the area. So common theme among these scenarios, who's going to take these pictures? So I had the idea for this app while I was studying abroad in Gold Coast, Australia. There was hundreds of photographers on the beaches with thousands of surfers in the water. No easy, to, no, no easy way for these two parties to connect. So I wanted to create an app that easily connected photographers to surfers and photographers to other clients. So we'll quickly go through a little rundown of the app. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time for a full demonstration, so we'll go over some of the basics. I'll talk about the client side of the app on the left side of the screen, while Tyler talks about the photographer side of the app on the right side of the screen. So first off, the client can request a session with different parameters such as time, location, date. And then as soon as that uh, gig is listed, I can see it on the photographer's side and claim that session. So I can go and I can view the parameters of this session and then enter my price and then claim that session. This then pops up on my app. I can view Tyler's portfolio of images to see his past work. I can see the price that he listed and then I can decide whether I want to confirm him as my photographer. And then once, the, once we meet up, get the shoe, I can upload the pictures and then review, um, leave a review for the client. I can then see the pictures directly on the app and download them to my phone, and I can review the photographer for future clients to see. So what's our plan? We need to design more of the app. We need to incorporate payment and chat features, incorporate drone video options into the app, um, and then we want to incorporate a way to display the photos to engage the clients. Um, we need to develop the app, move it off the low-code platform, and hire an app developer that will help me um, code this app. Uh, we hope to target amateur photographers at first and then move on towards a more professional client base. 
Uh, for the client side of the app, we hope to first target college audience and the surf industry, which we both have a lot of connections in. So a little overview, um, how this fund will make an impact. Uh, to scale and develop an app, it costs a lot of money. The more users you have on a database, the more users you have um, on a Google API key, the more expensive it is. Um, ben mentioned our customer base, hundreds of thousands of photographers across the U.S., and targeting surfers and social media influencers. So we have a business model kind of similar to Uber, where we charge a 3 to 7% rate to the client, and it's free of charge for the photographers to use to incentivize them to stay on our app. Uh, our competition is our gig-based apps like Thumbtack. However, there are no apps that connect photographers directly to clients. And the most frequently uh, asked question that we receive is why would a client and a photographer stay on the app? Maybe your favorite photographer is on vacation, or you're on vacation in an area you don't know. And one word answer, convenience. So we're two student-based photographers that hope to connect more people to photographers on apps. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs>
Okay. Peek into the future, yeah? Crystal ball? Promised? We're going to do a transition now. Uh, the judges will be transitioning from the incubation track judge panel to the acceleration track panel. And while that is happening, I would like to invite Chip Nisbet up to the stage uh, to share a few words with us. Let's have a round of applause for Chip Nisbet and the Nisbet family. Thank you, everybody. Um, this is amazing. It's, it's really neat. The, um, I first want to thank Liz and the Hurt Hub team. They've just done an amazing job. And the judges, we appreciate all their time and effort into this. This has been great. Uh, my mother and I started this 10 years ago um, to honor my father, who was a great Olin Nisbet, who was <coughs> alumni here. He was chairman of the board but also a great entrepreneur, started a successful business in Charlotte, Sterling Capital Management, and uh, instilled entrepreneurship in his children and his grandchildren who have started businesses. Um, and he would just be so proud of seeing where this is, where this is gone. And when we started this again 10 years ago, I think the first presentations were in a small room in the old uh, Patterson Court, and we may have had overhead projectors or something. I mean, it, it was just, it was, it was great, but it was small. And now, you know, 10 years later, I mean, the presentations have gotten, the quality is so impressive. The ideas are so impressive. And so I just thank everybody for, for, for being a part of this and, and taking it where it's coming. And, and in that 10 year period, we've got the Hurt Hub, um, you know, that Jay has done. And so, you know, the, just entrepreneurship at, at Davidson has really, uh, taken off, and so thank you everybody for all the support. Thank you. Okay, did the, did your guys have the mics yet? For the, for Odysseus? Yeah, okay. All right, everybody, we're now into the second half. Remember, this is the acceleration track. These are the seven entrepreneurs competing with seven minutes of presentation and three minutes of Q&A for the $25,000 equity investment prize. All right, so uh, judges, are you settled? Do you have any questions or need more time? You're all good? All right, and welcome. Okay, uh, let's bring up Odysseus Kufos to the stage for biz cards. Hello, everybody. My name is Odysseus Kufos, and I'm here to present to you best cards. Differentiate yourselves. Last year, I applied for an internship at Bain. Another 3,000 applicants applied. Only 100 got into interview one, 15 to interview two. Finally, two people landed the job. What differentiated them? Well, I don't know, but perhaps this can be best cards. During my educational career, I have attended hundreds of meetings and encountered the same issue in all of them, finding a professional way to get connected with others quickly and efficiently, making it embarrassing. Let me tell you, I'm not the only one. This is an issue that more than 85 million students are facing only in the US, more than 200 million globally. This is the issue that Biscard solves with the invention of the first engraver on demand, giftable aluminum business card. It's not a, just a card. It's a whole system. Tomorrow, easily understand the concept, compare it to a printer. The way that we aim on implementing this is by lending each machine to each interested institution. When the machine runs long cards, a designated staff member will fill the machine back up with blank cards. 
each chain can get connected to the printer and print the cards. The cards will then get automatically connected to their profile. Each card can, uh, the machine can hold five different types of cards. Each card can be differentiated either from their material, aka aluminum, plastic, or paper, or their color, uh, Davidson themed, black, white, whatever color. But all of the cards have something in common. They're all e-business cards. In typical e-business card fashion, you usually order a card, connect to your profile, go around, tap on everybody's phone, yeah? That's pretty much it. But our cards are not like that, although they can be used like that. You see, there is a key issue with all of the e-business cards currently on the market. The fact that to share your information, first you have to give the card and then take it back, it makes the other person feel disadvantaged. Combining that with the instance of the card malfunctioning, whoo, that makes the experience even worse. And yes, I'm speaking from personal experience, since I have used this method in the past. Well, I'm asking you, why not leave the card back? Well, that's what we're doing, by allowing users to print cards only in packs of 10. More specifically, we offer the same price for 10 cards as the price for one. This solution would allow you to choose whom you want to give the card to or not. The best thing is that these cards can be printed by the students at any time of day in approximately five to seven minutes, minimizing the need for huge order quantities or 30 day next day shipping fees. You may ask yourself, why metal? Well, because paper cards are outdated. Paper business cards have been around since the 15th century. And frankly, they haven't changed as much. And of course, according to American Express, metal makes it possible. At the same time, think about whom you give these cards to and whom you want to impress. According to Fortune 100, 57% of C-suite workers believe that business cards are critical for success. Dealing with them and tapping your phone to exchange information is not the way to go. Although the same business model can be applied to businesses, our aim is to first start by helping students. There are currently over 200 million students worldwide. Specifically, 18.5 million of them are students in the US, whereas 4.6 million of them are seniors looking for hiring managers to impress. This means that if all US college seniors buy only once from us, we're going to have approximately $93 million in annual revenue. The best thing is that every year, juniors become seniors giving us the ability to renew our market. As you can see, competition does not do well compared to us. Biz cards can offer affordable aluminum cards. <clears throat> How affordable? $2 each, compared to the $5 offered by the competition. We offer a low minimum order quantity of only 10 pieces per order, while offering in-demand engraving, meaning no need for delivery. The best thing of all is that we offer a product that can be physically touched proving important in a world where everything is digital. This is our minimum viable product at Davidson. Our projected annual revenue is $10,000, with an annual cost of $3,060, meaning that we're going to have approximately an annual profit of $6,940. With the price of the laser engraver being only $1,500, this means our, that our break-even volume is only 88.23 orders. According to the quotes I have received from Chinese manufacturers that I'll be visiting in May in China, I assume that with $10,000, I'm going to be able to turn my proof of concept into a fully working autonomous machine. I'm also going to need $13,500 to make the app that will store the information of all the holders. I need $1,500 for the manufacturing of the first laser engraver. The best thing is that after that, the only thing holding me back from doubling our reach is $1,500, meaning that with $1,500, we can reach each college institution one at a time. The next steps go as planned. Step one, make the proof of concept. As you can see, proof of concept is done. Step two, coordinate with a Chinese manufacturing facility as well as with an app developer to build the minimum viable product which will be placed at Davidson. Step three, reach out to other institutions and install base cards, lasers, and engravers on their campus. But why am I the perfect person for this business? Well, I'm a rising senior, meaning that I still have time to develop this as a student. Extremely important for a business like this, referring to students. Secondly, I'm a student, and I know what students need from personal experience. Thirdly, I know the vending machine business really well, and be the laser engraver myself. Finally, the most important thing is that I believe that if I win this competition, I'm gonna have the school support to pursue my project to the max. Imagine a world with best cards. Imagine a world where 200 million students globally can be heard and have the opportunity to showcase their personal achievements. 
since we have a little bit of time left, I also want to walk you through how potentially the app would look like. Specifically, this is my own, uh, the app has uh, implications for all the types of major. Specifically, this is my own. I have my resume on it. I have my connect with me button, meaning that every time somebody presses it, they can either add their email or their phone number, and then I'm the person initiating the connection with them. And I have my social media. Specifically, film studies uh, uh, students can add the portfolios and photos as well as arts, art majors can add their portfolios. Computer science, they can add coding samples and personal websites. STEM majors can add research articles that they have posted. It's extremely important to point out that all this information is stored on, the, on, the, on a drive, on the cloud, meaning that all the information in the cards, without having access to them, can be updated virtually, meaning that every person you have ever handed a card to can have up-to-date information about you. Thank you very much. a little bit about who the buyer would be? Are you envisioning students as your buyer or the career center, the, the colleges, the universities themselves? Share a little bit more about that, please. Thank you very much for your question. I have tried multiple scenarios of lending models for free and leasing models and trying to analyze each and every one of them. And I believe that the best answer is selling directly to students without charging the college for any of the price. Students could be from first year to seniors, and depending on their year, they would be purchasing most likely more cards. Talk to me a little bit about your supply chain. How do you get the engravers placed, maintained, and the materials resupplied? Thank you. Uh, we're currently gonna order big order, uh, orders from China which is gonna lower our cost of each card that is being manufactured. Each card is gonna be blank. And specifically for each course, they can either have a Davidson theme or a UNC theme or whatever the college theme is. And then the cards are gonna be sent from the warehouse to each student. And there's gonna be a student on each campus, which is gonna be occupied from us for three hours a week for, I think it's only one hour of work per week, depending on the demand that there is. Uh, and we're going to send the cars to them, and this is the person who's essentially going to hold the warehouse of the cars for, specific, for the specific machine. With a ten hour, ten dollar per hour wage, that's only thirty dollars a, a week. Welcome back. I applaud your serial, serial entrepreneurism. So thank you. Thank you so much. I, I've got a question. Can you explain kind of how this differentiates from a paper business card with a QR code? I mean, help me understand besides the metal aspect. Is there any other element that we need to be thinking about that would differentiate this card from a traditional paper card with a QR code? Specifically, paper business cards, as I said, are outdated. They're really outdated. Like they have been out since the 15th century, and like they haven't changed that much. Like it's. Like having the availability to have different kinds of uh, cards on you, specifically aluminum or plastic, and present yourself in a different way, specifically to others that you want to make a good impression and you want to differentiate yourself, like because that's the key aspect of it, is really important since, as I said, there are multiple applicants applying for jobs and you have to find a way to get you out, get yourself out. Thank you very much. Thank you. My mic on? There we go. Uh, next up, we have Constantine Desjardins for Direct Camp. He's also class of 2024. They took away the, the podium from me, but uh, we'll survive. <laughs> so, yes, my name is Constantine Desjardins. I'm a senior here at Davidson College, and my business, Direct Camp, helps summer camps fulfill their potential by providing the tech and business tools they need to succeed. So, before sharing a little bit more about Direct Camp, I wanted to take the time for us to get to know each other a little bit better. So by show of hands, who here has been to summer camp? Awesome. Who here has stayed in an Airbnb? Okay, let's remember that and keep it in mind for later. <laughs> so, my story starts in 2009. That's me. 
I went to camp for eight years at YMCA Camp Lawrence and then spent the next six years working as a camp counselor. Camp was such an impactful community for me and they gave so much to me that I felt I had an obligation to give back to the place that had given to me. And that's why along with my roommate in 2022, I founded Direct Camp with the vision of helping summer camps succeed and maximize their impacts. We started by building scheduling software that's been used for the past two summers by Camp Lawrence. And we've created over a thousand camper schedules, helping them save dozens of hours and dozens of headaches during that time. But after dedicating the past two years to learning about the most pressing challenges that are facing camps, we realized there's a much bigger opportunity for us to help camps and decided to pivot the focus of the company. We decided to pivot because we realized 30% of overnight summer camps are unprofitable. And moreover, they're sitting empty 70% of the year, nine months when camp is not in session. This means camps are hard pressed to find financial stability. They're reliant on the seasonal revenue, fitting in all the revenue they need uh, to operate across the year into the few short summer months. And they're already charging high tuition of nearly $180 a day. Kids here are also usually going for about a week or two. Um, and they're already offering campers an average of $50,000 in scholarships. So raising tuition is a double-edged sword. Finally, bringing on additional revenue streams is a challenging, complex, and logistic operational challenge um, where campers, camp directors want to focus on improving the experience of campers and not figuring out how to make a be better business. To give you a better sense of the camp market, there are 7,500 overnight sleepaway camps in the United States earning an average of $1.6 million for a total market size of around $12 billion. Right now, camps are earning 7.3% of their revenue from group conferencing and rental fees, giving us around $900 million spent on renting out camp facilities. But now I want to focus on the impact that renting out a camp's facilities can have on their bottom line and by extension, their overall operations and mission. First, let's consider the average overnight summer camp earning around $120,000 from rental fees. That's a good number, but it still makes up a very small portion of their overall revenue. Next, let's turn to YMCA Camp Greenville. Last year, they did 514 weddings, renting out their chapel for a two-hour slot and charging $3,200 to earn over a million dollars in revenue. The revenue they earned from weddings alone is almost the same as a camp, an average camp grosses in a year. And that's why we've created the Airbnb for summer camps. Direct camp enables camps to achieve year-round success by generating new or increased revenue streams with our fully integrated event management software. But we're not just stopping at software that simplifies the rental process because we know camps need more than just the administrative support we provide. There's a physical and operational challenges camps need to overcome if they wanna offer rentals. And that's why we're focusing on creating the marketing and advertising tools camps need to reach these new customers and providing staffing assistance with on-call property management from our vetted pool of a reputable former camp staff. Together, this gives camps both the operational capacity and the technology they need to bring these revenue streams to life. We've already proved that we can create software that camps use and love for the past two summers. Now, our event management software will provide all the administrative and planning tools camps need to launch or expand their rental operations. Based on our customer discovery so far, we've identified a number of features that are listed on the screen that camps need to succeed. We also know that every camp is unique and different, and that's why our software is designed to meet camps where they are, and it's built to accommodate these differences by allowing camps to build the event that works for them and choose how they want to structure their events. Whether a camp wants to offer a full-scale, elegant wedding with food and recreational activities, just rent out a cabin, or be like Camp Greenville and rent out a venue, we make it easy, for, and we give camps the ability to build a rental offering that works for them. The upshot is our software is not just a vitamin for the daily struggles of running a summer camp, but a cure that has the potential to transform not only the future of individual camps, but the entire camping industry. And by helping camps reach new customer segments and integrating the data from the rental operations into their already existing systems, we make it easy for camps to thrive all year long. 
Our model will be taking a t fixed 10% fee of the total booking amount, maybe five and five from each side. That means a Camp Greenville would get us $130,000, where a more average camp is around 13,000, for a total addressable market of $85 million. We want to focus on educating these camps. That means putting out online content and courses covering every aspect of hosting an uh, event at their camp and the best practices involved. Once we have camp leaders who know they want to take their rental operations to the next level, we'll be right there to provide the software and operational support they need. Our plan is simple. First, we want to acquire five early adopters, and we'll also spend this time getting to know, listening, and understanding the top priorities camp directors need from their software. From there, we'll finish building our software and take a prototype to an enterprise-level, full-suite SaaS platform that anyone can use. And that's by September. And then from there, we hope to demo to 100-plus target camps by the end of next summer, and hopefully we'll be able to work with one of those camps by the end of the 2025 season. These are the reviews that people give from their weddings at camp. As you can see, a lot of perfect, very positive, um, and these people appreciate that camps are a mission-based organization. So, as the great Conor McGregor said, we are here not to take part, but to take over. Our solution has the opportunity to not just transform individual camps, but the entire industry. Entrepreneurs are told to fall in love with their customers, and I unknowingly did this when I was eight years old, and that is our unfair advantage. Finally, any camp staff here today will tell you the transformational experience that working and attending summer camp had on them. This is a lifelong impact, and these people care about supporting these organizations. And finally, judges, I want to remind you that the fate of summer camps is at stake here. For 30% of camps, they might go out of business. And direct camp, we are committed to seeing not only the tradition of American summer camp continue, but thrive. So, thank you. As a proud camp steward for Boys Camper, I applaud the, uh, the initiative, so thank you. I've also used camps for off-site retreats in my business, so That's I like your good. idea. Target customer. I, I am curious, though. Um, from a camping perspective, staffing is a big issue. Absolutely. So, you know, and that's a rateable thing in the summer, obviously, when they know they have predictable revenue. But how would you match staffing with potential revenue opportunities when this is successful in terms of building? I mean, because there can be peaks and troughs in that. So how do you match staffing with the increased revenue and the timing of both? Yeah, definitely. So starting off with a, an initial customer or just trying it out with um, our first customers, I plan to tap into a lot of the connections I have with former, my former friends at YMC Camp Lawrence to try and get them to provide some staffing assistance, work with them, see if they want to come out for a weekend. And from there, I'm hoping to build out uh, a more comprehensive pool, like I said, of reputable and vetted camp staff. Maybe they have the weekend, maybe they don't have um, plans after uh, they leave camp and you know they're not going back to college for a year, they want something to do. Um, these are the people we would have in our pool and available to connect to our camps. So that's part of the service you're offering. It's not an expectation that camp would necessarily provide that yes, staff. Exactly. That's part of what you would I, yeah, offer. Yeah, that's one of the value processes. And that's a issue we've identified as camps struggle because they really only operate in the summer. Um, they don't have that full-time staff that they could just send out. So um, thanks for putting the pressure on us. I feel like we're going to kill Christmas if this doesn't uh, <laughs> break your way. Um, so, like Jay, I was also a, a camper. Um, I grew up going to camp in northern Wisconsin. Awesome. Um, probably not where you want to have a wedding in the winter. Yeah, definitely. Um, so, I guess the question is, as you think about your addressable market, have you looked at where camps are geographically and thought about the ones that really do lend themselves to this sort of stuff on a year-round basis versus in, you know, individual weekends when it's sunny and warm? Yeah, definitely. I think there is a very practical constraint. So like my, uh, my camp is on an island, you can't get there in the winter, so they're not a good target customer, and that's definitely a main concern. So right now we're focusing on places that have a little bit of a longer season, so you know, more warm climates in the south. But also um, there's a camp called Kiev Wavis in New York, and they do year-round facilities. So some places actually do have winterized facilities where they can somewhat more accommodate um, people year-round, but you're absolutely right. There's going to be places um, where winter events just really don't make sense. 
It sounds like you've done a fair amount of customer discovery, which I love as a former anthropology major here at Davidson. So in these conversations that you're having with camps, what's coming up the most in terms of what's kept them, aside from things like the staffing, the skills, et cetera, when you walk through everything that you can provide, what keeps them from jumping in and saying, absolutely sign us up right now? Like, is there any barrier in that sales process for you that you're seeing? Yeah, I think there's a couple. Um, like was mentioned, uh, okay. So for our next presenter, we're shaking things up in two ways. Uh, the first way is you're about to see an alum, not a current student, but an alum from the class of 2018. Her name is Nisha Buznet, and she's also joining remotely to share with us Evergreen ESG. All right, you can hear me okay? Yeah. We can hear you. Awesome. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for hosting me remotely. Did you know that 80% of the companies in the S&P 500 are now measuring and quantifying their environmental impact like never before? In order to do this in a meaningful way, they are evaluating not only their own actions, but those of their numerous vendors and suppliers as well. I'm Nisha Busnet, the founder of Evergreen ESG. Evergreen ESG is a sustainability solution agency that started with a goal to help businesses drive positive environmental, social, and governance change. We do this by helping small businesses demonstrate and communicate their impact and meet sustainability requirements from their customers. ESG topics are at the forefront of a movement to see businesses report on non-financial data, such as how a company safeguards natural resources, how they manage their employees, or how they govern relationships with other businesses, such as their suppliers. Slide. Our clients are often small suppliers to large multinational corporations. Over 360 influential companies have pledged to reduce their indirect greenhouse gas emissions, also called scope three emissions. Scope three emissions are considered indirect because they come from upstream sources, such as a product's outsourced packaging and downstream sources, such as transportation emissions from distribution. For most large multinational companies, over 90% of these indirect scope three emissions actually come from their suppliers. To address these emissions, these large companies hand down sustainable supplier requirements and over 19 million small businesses are or will be subject to these changes in the coming years. These sustainability supplier requirements vary widely from one company to another, but often include building an ESG strategy, conducting a materiality assessment and reporting on their impact. They're expected to report in line with various global frameworks and standards. If you don't know what a lot of this really means, trust me, you're not alone. Small business suppliers don't know how to address these requirements, find the language complex, and don't know how long this process will take. There are currently three ways small businesses try to solve this problem, but none of them are effective solutions. Most small businesses have no one internally in a sustainability position that can address these requirements, meaning handling it in-house is not really an option. They could contact sustainability firms, but firms almost always cater to large public companies dealing with international or federal regulations and don't often serve small businesses. They could also reach out to ESG consultants and hope they have the experience to help them fulfill these requirements. However, ESG and sustainability are incredibly broad. You can be a successful sustainability consultant for alternative energy solutions, green buildings, or even climate policy and not know anything about supplier requirements. When my client Todd first reached out to me, he told me about his energy efficiency company Ease and how he was facing new requirements from one of their clients, a large public utility company. He ran a business that helped the community and conserved energy, but didn't have any of these new sustainability requirements in place. 
In his words, these requirements seem to be tailored to large organizations, manufacturers, and publicly traded companies. He asked me, how do we create a sustainability plan that is appropriate for our company size, industry, and budget? Evergreen worked with Todd to develop an ESG strategy to fit his business. Just as we worked with a travel company to conduct their materiality assessments and a culinary business to develop their environmental reporting standards. Slide. Yep. After Davidson, I started working with small businesses, helping them tell their sustainability stories. I fell in love with this portion of the market and their drive to make the world a better place in so many different, fun, and interesting ways. If you search sustainability on Upwork, one of the largest freelance platforms in the world, my name is at the top of the list. My profile is in the top 1% of profiles on Upwork based on an average rating of 4.9 out of 5 stars and my cultivation of lasting client relationships. I've worked with over 80 clients successfully and have new potential cl clients reaching out to me almost daily. I haven't initiated a single com communication or sought any clients myself in two years. I turn down over 50% of the opportunities that come my way because I don't have the capacity to take on new business. That is why the majority of the funding will go towards personnel to help handle my current workload and capture this additional business. Presently, you can only find my work and profile on Upwork, where there is still growth potential for me. Being in the top 1% means that Upwork bets my clients for me and recommends my profile to new potential clients. I plan to create an Upwork agency so that new clients will recognize my company instead of just my name. Additional funding will go towards a website to establish Evergreen ESG outside of the Upwork platform. The last $5,000 will go towards developing more frameworks that will expand my current offerings with digital assets that small businesses can buy, such as flexible ESG strategies or reporting guidance documents. Revenue is shown in green and the amount I spend on personnel costs is shown in red as it is one of my largest expenses. I went from making less than $7,000 in 2021 to making nearly six figures in 2022 with less than 10% of revenue spent on personnel costs. In 2023, I cut back on work and personnel to try and find more work-life balance and saw revenue suffer as a result. Annualized for my time off, my 2023, 2023 revenue was comparable to my 2022 revenue. The winner of the 2019 Nisbet Venture Fund competition stated that the biggest mistake he made as a first-time founder was not optimizing for a co-founder from the beginning. I am already starting to see the cost of not having a team to grow with, which is why the end goal is to hire a full-time employee by 2025. I started Evergreen ESG because I believe that the private sector has the power and influence to address the climate crisis head-on and drive environmental, social, and governance change for good. With funding, Evergreen can pave the way for small businesses to have even greater impact. Thank you. Can you speak to your strategy to scale the business beyond adding the additional labor and, and also the marketing through the website? In particular, I'm curious if there are ways you're looking to leverage technology so that you are not necessarily having to scale your, your labor as much as you grow the business. Yes, definitely. Um, and so I definitely want to have that personal website and leverage LinkedIn as kind of like an outreach strategy um, to be able to scale outside of the Upwork platform. Um, but I do think I can continue to grow on the Upwork platform as well. Um, and AI can absolutely be used for a lot of this stuff. It's very regulatory. Um, and I have already worked with teams who have used AI to kind of leverage this sort of like regulatory sustainability thing before. Um, and so I, I do think technology can help a lot um, in terms of staying on top of regulation and also producing the materials um, that are being regulated. Misha, thanks. Um, should I think of this as tech-enabled services or professional services? I would say more professional services um, because there definitely is a level of consulting involved just helping, even if it's a like a one-off kind of deliverable for an ESG strategy, you need to kind of t work with the client and um, get them to understand what they're doing. And there's a good chance that they end up returning for more sustainability-related requirements after that. So professional services. 
And I apologize if I missed it. Can you speak to the revenue model and kind of how the how revenue is generated and how things are billed and the payment flows and kind of just help me understand how revenue is generated? Yeah, and so um, clients reach out to me on Upwork, and they I either have an hourly contract with them or a fixed price contract with them. Um, usually, fixed price for some of this kind of deliverable materiality assessment ESG strategy, um, but there's also a consulting aspect of it as well. Um, that I usually charge hourly. And so it's a little bit of both, um, but I'm trying to leverage more of that, those fixed price assets um, with funding. We're all set. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. All right, let's welcome the Venture Mesa to the stage. Thomas Athey, class of 2024, on behalf of his business partner, Andres Patero. Hello. Oh, working? Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Thomas Athey, and I'm here to show you what the future of the music industry looks like. Musicians no longer need to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to record music in studios. Today, hit records are made in bedrooms and on laptops. The same is the case for distribution. No more physically pressing CDs or vinyl. I wasn't even born for those days. Today, for $5 and the click of a button, your music is distributed globally and instantly. These tools are transforming the music industry right in front of our eyes. In 2023, 50% of Spotify revenue came from independent artists. That number was only at 12% six years prior. Record label services are just not as coveted as they used to be. Although anyone today can, can be a musician, Independent musicians still need the administrative infrastructure that a record label provides. Without it, music creators often fail to capture the value that they've created. 67% of artists don't have a process for discussing and establishing ownership splits. 69% of artists have lost money due to missing out on rightful ownership or credit in a song. It's very clear that artists need help protecting their intellectual property. The solution is a software that organizes and legally protects music projects so that all contributors get their fair share. This is MESA, a file admin and IP management system for music creators. I'm going to walk you through how an artist would use MESA. So you can see here, if I'm an artist, these are the projects that I'm a part of. Down here, I can see that I've just been invited to two new projects. And above, I can create my new project from this dashboard. I'm also able to listen to all the various audio files from my various projects. Now, I'm going to go into one of the project pages that I'm a part of. This is a song called Luna. As you can see here, I'm a producer in this song. A song is rarely created in one sitting, so down below, you can see the audio files as the song progresses. Above the audio files, we have the metadata matrix. This is where I can keep track of all of my other collaborators, and throughout the creative process, all of us can propose and track ownership splits. This user-friendly interface hides the fact that every creator who makes an account on Mesa has a smart wallet created for them. This smart wallet enables blockchain functionality. Both the audio files and the information in the metadata matrix get time-stamped onto the blockchain. 
This ensures that if myself or any of my collaborators ever have an issue in the future, if we ever have a disagreement in the future, we all have proof of the work that we've done. The last step that we have to build out in this beta product is our modular contract builder. The modular contract builder takes the information from the metadata matrix and creates an ownership contract for all parties to sign in app when a song is complete and before it goes out to distribution. A few companies provide administrative capabilities to artists, but none of them have the full stack. And further, furthermore, none of them have that full stack that includes IP protection. We believe that IP protection is the most important part of the admin stack, and this is what differentiates us from our competitors. We have two ways that we are showing momentum and traction. The first is through our waitlist and focus group. We currently have 88 musicians on, a fo on, on our waitlist, and within that, a smaller group, a smaller focus group of seven artists from all over, from seven emerging artists that are strategically located in both the United States and Latin America. All of the artists on our waitlists account to over tens of millions of streams, and this is without us even having a product complete yet. Our second mode of traction is partnerships with music tech and music business education communities. These are communities where artists are already looking to get an edge in their careers. We currently have seven partnerships in our sales pipeline, and these partnerships have a total of 100,000 musicians in them. We'll be charging creatives, creators $7.99 per month or $60 per year per creator with a tiered subscription system as we grow our offerings. We are in the final sprint of our beta product, and the summer months will be spent deploying MESA 1.0. MESA 1.0 will be our first revenue-generating product. Our goal is to reach $100,000 in annual recurring revenue by the end of this year. That comes out to about 1,000 paying artists. We will then use that traction to raise a seed round. The $25,000 will be spent on software development, paying our software development team, paying a video editor who's helping us with our content creation strategy, and administrative costs such as trademarking and accounting. As I stated earlier, my name is Thomas Athey, and my co-founder is Andreas Botero. I'm overseeing product development, and I'm a senior here at Davidson College. I spent my first two years of college building a community that educated people about blockchain technology. We had over 1,000 members in that community and over 1 million views across socials. Andreas is overseeing product development and comes from 20 years of various roles in the music industry. He has a degree from the Berklee College of Music, has developed artists in Latin America that have more than a billion streams to date, has exited his own record label, and has spent the last three years researching emerging technology and how it can help the music industry. I'm going to be working on MESA full time after school because I recognize the opportunity we have to disrupt the music industry. MESA is here to provide the new aged music creator with the tools they need to operate efficiently and maximize their creative wealth. Thank you. Within your founding team, do either of you have technical abilities to contribute to the software development? Um, if you can speak a little bit more about that $15,000 budget and your degree of confidence that that will be enough to fully develop the product. So, um, let me show you really quickly. We have a technical team. Um, our lead engineer comes from, originally was a sound engineer for five years and then taught himself to code, has been coding for um, 13 years now, and so he really understands the needs that we have as a music tech company and also as, you know, as, as a developer. And then we have another developer additionally has been focused on helping creatives. And um, so this money will go to finishing this beta and then deploying our first, uh, MESA, what we're calling MESA 1.0, which is that first kind of fully publicly facing product that we believe that we will start generating revenue with. Thomas, you showed on your um, competitor slide a, a few 
um, very well capitalized players, and it doesn't seem like they're very horizontally differentiated in terms of what they're providing. I'm just curious as to why you think the market is still as fragmented as it is, and someone like Dropbox hasn't rolled this up into a solution yet. Yeah, because they provide file organization, and that's useful, but you know, that the file organization is just one part of what a musician needs, and as I stated in the pitch, we really think that IP protection is the crucial part that differentiates us, and Dropbox doesn't understand that. We've, um, my co-founder has spent three years researching um, kind of the specifically IP disruption technology. We've spent the last, we've been working on this for almost two years and have interviewed tons of customers and we simply just have a better understanding of who our customer is and you know, it's not someone that Dropbox or Google Drive is focused on. I grew up with eight, eight track tapes, so Google that. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not clear of the revenue stream back. I, I get the creation of the, the split, the contracts. I'm not sure I understand how the revenue gets back to the artist. I understand the split, but I'm not clear on that. So right now, um, sorry, right now we, um, the revenue, it's just, we're essentially creating the contracts for the artists. And the whole problem that we learned in our customer research is that artists talk about ownership when the project's already completed. So in a disorganized process, that means you're either not included or you don't think you've got a fair share but it's too late because the work's already done. So we're providing the, the IP infrastructure that throughout the process you're able to be open and transparent about ownership and then we create the contract for you. And so then you have that contract and then we're using the blockchain technology to have proof of the work you've done if there's ever an issue in the future. Thank you. All right, our next venture is Sunken Paradise. This is an alumni team, all from the class of 2021. Redden McElveen, Christopher Alvarez, Paul Stouffer, and Ragnar Schmidt. This is way more of an adrenaline rush than presenting for my dog and grandma. So, um, <laughs> hi, my name is Redden McElveen. Um, these disembodied heads behind me are Paul Stouffer, Chris Alvarez, and Ragnar Schmidt. Um, we're super excited to be here, and we're Sunken Paradise, a company that was started with one purpose in mind, and that's to take on the fast fashion industry. Hey everyone, sorry I'm about to throw some doom facts at you that definitely won't brighten your day, but I think it's important to highlight just how damaging fast fashion is to the global environment. The fast fashion industry is the, lar the second largest consumer of water and is responsible for about 10% of all global carbon emissions. This problem is largely caused by huge corporations who chase trends and continuously pump out tons and tons of low quality clothing that often ends up in landfills shortly after. The other more complex part of the issue though is you and me, the consumer. On average, we only wear a piece of clothing seven times before disposing of it. This entire model isn't sustainable in any way, and that's why we founded Sunken Paradise as a solution to fast fashion. Really, our aim is to transform fashion into a more collectively sustainable effort where all of our products serve a greater utility and encourage our customers to get outside and enjoy, but also protect the beauty of the earth we share. Essentially, we wanted to develop a company that reflected our values by creating super high quality, sustainable products made entirely of eco-friendly materials. To maximize the lifespan of each of our products, we are instituting a new program. We call it the Recycled Products Exchange Program, whereby our customers can send back any used Sunken Paradise clothing. In, in exchange, we'll give them a discount off a of future purchase. And We'll take that product and either recycle it or donate it to another organization. Also, to fight back against the pollution of oceans and rivers that's caused by fast fashion, 
We partner with an organization called Clean Hub, who will collect a pound of plastic and, and recycle it for each purchase made on our site. So you're probably Back to you, Reddy. Yeah, thank you, Chris. You're probably wondering right now, how do we stand out from the competitors? The fashion industry is notoriously saturated. Well, at Sunken Paradise, we believe in studying trends and then setting them. So if you look at the athleisure and yoga market, athleisure alone is valued over $300 billion right now. We believe this presents a unique opportunity for our company to exploit. Uh, we want to position ourselves something of an anti-Lululemon, our Lululemon for people that don't give unsolicited cryptocurrency and finance advice. Um, so we're going to do this by aiming for a younger male demographic between age, ages 18 and 30. We're going to make sure our clothing is casual and really fashioned after skirt, uh, surfer and skater styles. Additionally, everything's going to be highly functional and utilitarian. You can really wear our clothes for anything and always feel comfortable and like you belong. So say you want to play a Jack Johnson song on the beach, go for a hike, or catch a yoga class. You can do all those things in our clothing. Additionally, we want to take the values that we learned from Davidson, community and empathy, and really imbue that in our company's ethos. So we're going to put a premium, as we already have, on customer service, and also giving back to communities that are impacted by adverse climate events. For example, we uh, donate a percentage of our funds to um, those impacted by the wildfires in Maui, and we also want to encourage our customers to, to give back and cultivate green spaces while also um, participating in environmental cleanups. And so far, our data and sales indicate that there is a demand for this new conceptualization of fashion, both stylistically and ethically. We've done over $12,000 in sales so far, had 20,000 website visits, all with an ad budget of under $900. Additionally, our best-selling product, our Spanish tile pant, has sold out every single run. We've had seven total runs so far. It's sold out in a, under a week each time. We've also partnered with some of the biggest names in extreme sports um, and also music and local design studios. We've worked with the bands Toledo and also Oliver Hazard, two very popular bands. And we've also worked with Alicia Zucchini and William Truebridge, pictured above. Alicia was just featured in a Netflix documentary, documenting her story as the top female freediver in the world. And William Truebridge is the top male freediver. We've also partnered with one of the best product designers in London to create a novel yoga product that allows you to attach your yoga mat to pretty much anything. Your backpack, your suitcase, your bike. You don't have to pay an extra fee if you're traveling with your yoga mat and want to ca catch a class in Costa Rica or something. You don't have to worry about the logistics of cramming it into your suitcase. It's versatile and also gives us a much needed toehold into the yoga market, which we think is essential for our continued growth and development as a company. We also think we have the right leadership team here. Pictured above, <laughs> uncanny resemblance. Speaking for myself as a CEO, my background is in entrepreneurship. After graduating from Davidson, I started a company that specializes in short-term rental um, optimization and um, maximizing revenues on platforms like Airbnb and VRBO. So I'm bringing a mindset very much so focused on efficiency and optimization, which I know surprises every teacher I've ever had at Davidson. Um, speaking for Chris, our COO, he worked for a publicly traded med tech company on the supply and uh, on sales side of things. So he's bringing much needed and valuable experience, networking with vendors and making sure we're good on the supply chain side. Paul Stouffer uh, studied environmental sciences at Davidson, and he's also currently studying sustainable design in London. So he has this unique synthesis of knowledge about best um, environmental practices and also artistic creativity and direction. And last, but certainly not least, is Ragnar Schmidt. He's our numbers guy, and he studied econ at Davidson. He currently does accounting for a, a company that does land conservation in Bend, Oregon, and he makes sure that we're on track financially so we can scale responsibly and ethically. At Davidson, we learned that the solution to the most complex issues in our, in our country and our world are often holistic ones. We believe that our unique approach to fashion and also our management team, combined with your support, can allow us to be that holistic solution to the issue of fast fashion. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. With everything you plan to do from that uh, Davidson quality customer service, I like the way that sounds, um, to the recycling efforts, it, it all sounds expensive. What's the price point for the pants that you described, those ones where they sold out every run? And also, if you can speak a little bit about your margins. Absolutely. So current cost per unit for those pants is around $31. We sell them for $70 um, per pant. So it's a pretty nice markup, especially considering the 
previously tight, like tight margins of the fashion industry. Um, in terms of like implementing the clothing recycling, we plan on doing that a later, later, uh, <clears throat> later stage when we're in a better place financially. But the margins for everything that we sell is around, I mean, it's around 100% markup for everything. So we believe that we'll be in the correct position uh, long term to continue to grow and implement that responsibly. As you think about product differentiation and your customer uh, acquisition strategies and costs, how do those compare um, kind of across what seems to be a fairly crowded space? And what is a differentiator that uh, you bring to it? Yeah, um, thank you for the question. We believe that we're competitive because like our general personality for our brand. We like to put a premium on comedy and we're also young guys, we believe we have an edge over like the 60 year old men who are trying to understand like what we find to be funny in everything. Um, we <laughs> <laughs> Which I hope is the right answer. And uh, also like currently we've, we're getting over 20,000 <laughs> visits to our website all with an ad budget of under 900. We believe that we can con continue to scale that up with a legitimate ad budget and just multiply that number. Um, a solid conversion rate as well for um, a Shopify store that's high quality is around 7%. We're aiming for a 5% conversion rate. And the basic math there is if we multiply those organic visits by a factor of five and then convert even 4% of those, then we're a company that's making over $400,000 a year because our lowest um, cost of item is around $62. So. So for the record, I'm 57, so am I still cool? Sir, you look All right, good. That's what I just wanted to check. I, I, I'm curious, the, the yoga mat, is this more of a vertical integration play you're seeing, or is it a horizontal in terms of expanding beyond clothing? Kind of help me understand. How, yeah, how they... we, so we're hoping to expand with our yoga product that we've developed. Um, the prototype was just finalized. We're, working with, we're in negotiations with manufacturers right now. Um, so we're hoping to expand into the yoga category. But also all our products kind of seamlessly integrate because they're highly functional. You can do yoga in our pants and everything. So um, we're going to continue to grow and develop based off this new invention and um, hopefully vertically expand in the future. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Hey, thank you. everybody listen up this is number seven of seven and we're about to talk about wine u.s georgia wine and let's welcome sandro chumashvili to the stage can everybody hear me hear me well yeah. wonderful hello ladies and gentlemen and i'm so excited to present to you u.s georgia wines i'm sandro chumashvili born and raised in georgia and i'm a senior economics here at davidson I started this business three and a half years ago. So, Georgia, since when does Elena start producing such amazing wines? Well, as you probably understood by my accent, we're talking about the Eastern European country of Georgia, which is recognized by UNESCO as an intangible heritage site. And we pride ourselves in being the cradle of wine. We made the first wine ever 8,000 years ago. It's so dear to my heart that during the ancient times, when the Georgian warriors would go to war, they would put the vine branches in their internal pockets, so if they were to die on soil, they believed that the vines would sprout out of them. But, okay, well, the stories, the lores, what makes Georgian wines so special, other than the fact that they're old? Three things. First, ancient winemaking technique. We do not use oak uh, barrels to ferment our wines. We use these huge clay vessels, and you'll see it on many images down the road, where we pour this grape juice and the nature itself ferments the wines. Second, 
Because of such a natural way of fermentation, it has a lot of antioxidants, which means that it A, decreases the chance of you getting certain types of cancers, B, decreases your chance of getting Parkinson's, and three, in moderation, increases your cognitive ability. And third, which is very important marketing point, there is no dish that you can tell me, even pineapple and pizza, that I cannot pair with a Georgian wine. Just look what the judges have in front of them. Some of the wines that they have are white, red, amber wines. What is amber wines? Amber wines is how people used to make wines 8,000 years ago, when they treat white grapes like red grapes, when they did not separate the skins from the grapes and the tannins. And that's what you get. Has anybody ever heard of amber wines? No, because you are not in Europe. In Europe, it's getting more popular, but not in North Carolina. Yet. As of 2022, the North Carolina wine market is worth $6.1 billion. With a CAGR of 6.7%, it is expected to reach $12.5 billion, with niche markets accounting for $1.3 billion. The Georgian wines, which can easily dominate the niche market category, we expect that will at least be able to have the sales of $30 million by 2030. And this is just in North Carolina. Our dreams reach far beyond that. My mission is to source exclusively from the small wineries that um, continue producing the wines with this Georgian way of winemaking. And this is more than just a business for me. It is actually saving and bringing to the Western culture something from the small country that if we do not promote westwards might eventually die out because this is labor intensive, this is tedious, and the main consumers of Georgian wines are currently Russians and Chinese which are not ready to pay a big amount of money for a bottle and it is more expensive than the average wine because it is so labor intensive. Well, my business model, who am I? First and foremost, I'm an importer. In my three years, I managed to already have the federal importer's license and the North Carolina's license of distribution, which is, if you're working with alcohol, is a big issue. And just to say, I started this business before I turned 21, so you can imagine how hard that was. Second of all, I'm a wholesaler. I work with the restaurants and I will only have one shop where I will put my wine because I'm realistic. I know that if I was to put the Georgian wine in Harris Theater, everybody's gonna walk around it because it's not California, people don't know what Georgia is. So we are educating sommeliers and waiters in top tier restaurants where they will educate the consumers. My goal, my issue is to sell the first bottle. Once you try Georgian bottle, you will keep coming back to it. And third, direct to consumer. This is the long term vision. Uh, because there are some licensing issues in North Carolina when it comes to serving direct to consumer, we will need to partner with somebody. Um, any shop will be fine with sharing the margins with Georgian Wines. Down the road, we really want to utilize AI and have it integrate the website where using a questionnaire, I will pair the best wine for you depending on your climate, your geography, your physical activity, and most importantly, the food that you eat. And third of all, I really want to use the VRs, and I know that in the judge we have an expert on the VRs, in order to enhance the sampling experience. And for that all, we need the, we need the investments. My financial advantage is in few things. I want you to remember two numbers are actually the same, zero and zero. Thanks to negotiations and the goodwill of the Georgian wineries, that is the amount of money I have to pay to the Georgian wineries before the wines actually arrive here. And then every two months, I'm paying them 20%, which means that the only cost I have is um, just a shipping cost. But what about the warehouse, Sandro? Thanks to the great support of one of my advisors, Jill Marcus, major shout out, I do not have to pay a single cent for the warehouse before the wines arrive, and after that, every month, my warehouse lease is just $1,000. I have a total vertical integration which allows me to be independent and be in the power of my pricing. Second of all, I'm a preferred wine importer, and I need to match this one more time. There is no Georgian wine importer in North Carolina. There is a presence of Georgian wines, but it is from the imports that are based either in DC, in California, and many of them do not solely follow the Georgian traditional way of winemaking. And third, local support. You cannot name me a single, single executive based on Main Street that I have not spoken to. And tried Georgian wines. Let's go deeper into financials. My, I'm going to start very aggressively when it comes to financials. On average, we are 17% cheaper than average of our competitors. And despite such thinner than average margins, which is still $5.2 per bottle, 
after I spend $10,600 for shipping, and after you invest $25,000 into this business and we sell it just one container, our pure profit before taxes is almost $110,000. Just because you invest $25,000, and there is a traction that we're going to talk about right now, our revenue after everything will be $110,000. So traction, what have you done? Are people going to buy Georgian wines? Here are some names of the restaurants with whom had the wine tastings, with whom we have pre-contractual agreements, and who want to have Georgian wines in the restaurants. And those are big dogs. The sizes actually might vary from 200 to just four bottles, but in this case from the beginning, it's the name that matters. Out of 12, uh, sorry, out of 14 wine tastings taste that we had, we have not had a single restaurant that has not bought Georgian wine. Here's the timeline. Here's how we're going to deploy the investment. The main is going to be in shipping, then warehouse, inventory, and marketing. But the main is shipping, so $25,000 is ready to get my company through the roof. Huge shout out to my mentors, and thank you so much. Let's talk Georgian wine. So now you're talking about something that 50-year-old men understand. Um, <laughs> It seems to me this whole thing hinges on customer adoption of Georgian wine. If you're the only importer, you've got a, a lock on the market. If you don't have adoption, you got a bit of a struggle. What's the marketing plan to get customers to try it? I get that once they try it, they love it. But how do you actually attract them to the product in the first place? I'm so happy you asked the question. It's called test on methodology. What Tesla used to do in the beginning is that they would only sell $100,000 supercars, so then now when an average person, every Joe drives $20,000 Tesla, they feel like they're driving that. So what we do is that we target the wine ecosystem first, we are promoting it between the best sommeliers, the best wineries, and top tier restaurants, so that when it leaks out of the ecosystem, people associate Georgian brand and Georgian wine to some sort of prestige. That's why I'm not planning to go mainstream anytime soon. I want to make sure I have the biggest hold of this ecosystem with the best chefs, best sommeliers with whom we've already spoken, and then once it leaks, we're gonna size up eventually. Because I cannot compete with Californian wines when it comes to volume, but I can destroy them when it comes to quality. <laughs> Am I confident? Yeah. <laughs> Prove me wrong. I love your passion, and I appreciate that. Um, I, I'm curious the mix between uh, restaurants and DTC. I mean, uh, I'm involved in the wine business, and I understand direct-to-consumer is by far the most profitable channel. So help me kind of understand the mix between restaurant sales and DTC. You mentioned that it's more of a future aspiration, mm -hmm. but help me understand that is that's the more profitable channel. Good question. So first is compliance. In North Carolina, you cannot directly serve the consumers if you are an importer. But second, more important, is that there's not enough education about Georgian wines. So we will have one shop which will serve it directly to the consumers, but it's not enough yet to put it in the stores or to directly serve to the consumers. So we won't have an exclusive agreement with one shop where we have, we'll have larger margins than we would have with the restaurants and then we'll have a profit share with them. So DTC will simply not work right now because people will not go out of their way to buy Georgian wine unless they have tried it. So that's what I'm trying to do right now. You mentioned that you haven't had any tastings with any of the restaurants where folks didn't decide to buy Georgian wines. Um, say a little bit about that. Did they give you any type of negative feedback? As, as someone who really tries to get as close as possible to the customer, I, I have a little question mark if nobody says anything negative. Well, um, restaurants have different types of demands. For example, shout out to Kindred for telling me that I have to bring my wine opener with me. Uh, that was the biggest issue and the biggest mistake that I made. But what is is that some restaurants want white wine, some restaurants want red wine. So not everybody will be buying all those wines, right? It will depend on the restaurant, but every restaurant wants at least some sort of Georgian wine because of their culture history. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations. All right, everybody. So that was seven of seven. Uh, I just need some adjectives. Adjectives that come to mind about the experience you just had? Awesome. awesome. What was this over here? Inspiring. Inspiring. I heard something else over here. Is holy smokes an adjective? <laughs> that was mine, was holy smokes. 
Uh, for those of you that are Davidson alums, are you like me and you're really happy you got in when you did? I wasn't sure if I would make it today. Yes. Yes. So uh, incubation competitors, acceleration competitors, well done. We're ready to go, yeah? Step to the front of the stage and follow instructions. Thank you. It's on my resume under special skills. Okay, so uh, I'm going to read you another quote from the Merry Wives of Windsor. You remember I started with Merry Wives of Windsor? A man named William Shakespeare wrote that play. His birthday and his death day were Tuesday this week. Things Davidson people know. All right, so here's the quote. If money go before, all ways lie open. If money go before, all ways lie open. What the quote means is basically, money is not everything, but it can make a tremendous difference. And we're here to give out some money. Are you ready? Okay. So I have the pleasure of giving the first of three awards. So earlier you saw the competition for the 5,000 and you saw the competition for the $25,000 investment, the equity investment. I'm going to give out a $2,500 award for an online audience vote winner. So last week on the Hurt Hub website, all of these competitors had posted a pre-recorded video of their pitch and people from all over the world were invited to vote on their online audience favorite. And I have the results here. Are we ready? All right. The $2,500 award for the online audience vote goes to Groton. We want him up on the stage, yeah? Up on the stage. That'll probably... You, oh, ah, look at that. Look at that. So congratulations. Yeah, yes. Amazing. Yeah. 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 Perfect. All the judges around. Let's go. I would like to say I forgot to mention that... Uh, He's also the class of 2027, which is our youngest participant tonight. Are you in? Okay. Yeah. All righty, congratulations. <laughs> All right. I'm now going to turn it over to the incubation judge team. Uh, who is your representative for the incubation? Ah, right here. Perfect. You take it away. All right, can we just give it up one more time for the incubation uh, startups? That was incredible. Uh, this was an incredibly hard decision on our, our team's part. Um, and I have to say, uh, Liz, I think we need a little bit more money for market research for the Surfo team. Can we get them back out to the beach soon? Um, there were, uh, as a whole, the judges wanted to share that we thought all of these ideas were incredible and are worthy of pursuing and, and getting to that, that next step, regardless of if they are the winner tonight. But for us, ultimately, it came down to um, one company that was serving a very um, vulnerable population and actually went out of their way to build a working prototype. So let's give it up for Mike and True Pharma. <laughs>
once in my life I would like a reception like that. <laughs> All right, and now let's go over to the uh, acceleration judge team. Great, thank you. Um, that reminds me of what my family sounded like when they figured out that I'd actually graduated from Davidson. <laughs> uh, so as hard as it may be to believe, I showed up here in August of 1989, um, a fair bit skinnier, a lot less gray, and completely and totally unprepared based on what I saw in here tonight. Um, just incredible job um, to all of the innovators and the entrepreneurs that have presented. It's really humbling to see what's happening on this campus and has been made possible by Jay and Chip and the Nesbitt family. It's just, it's really moving. Um, like the, um, the earlier track, we felt that all of these participants were worthy of consideration. And in the end, we did have to pick one, and we were very, very impressed by the market knowledge and the domain expertise that this particular um, presentation contained. But I want to underscore for those that aren't selected, um, tonight for y'all is not no, it's just not right this second. And I would encourage you as a frequently failed entrepreneur, stay at it. Continue to refine your business model, your pitch, your understanding of your addressable markets. We've tried to give you a little bit of feedback to steer you in those directions. But again, if we had unlimited money, um, <laughs> it, it would be no problem at all to, to put money behind every one of these. But in the end, um, we did feel and are pleased to award the 2024 acceleration track to Mesa and to Thomas. <laughs> All right, everyone, on behalf of everyone that is involved in and supporting inside and outside uh, the Hurt Hub, uh, on behalf of everyone, I get the pleasure to say thank you, but it's on behalf of every single person uh, that comes together to make all of this possible. So thank you, and welcome to the future. Thank you. Oh, give it up for our MC. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Woo!